So what I'm going to be working on today is a project for, I believe it's Dark Moon Metal's oldest client, and uh, she is a real friend of the business. To give you a little bit of background, um, she was actually Dana's Girl Scout leader way back in the day. So um, Pat at Gatesmore Lighting, um, I wanted to kind of showcase her a little bit in this video because she has been really good to us and we do quite a bit of work for her, and now her daughter is starting to carry the torch. Speaking of torches, what they do is make lanterns. Now this is not one of theirs. Um, this is something that actually was here probably since I was five years old. Now Pat's business has been around a lot longer. It actually started uh, with her father. The bottom portion of the lantern is what we refer to as the lantern carriage. To give you an idea of the scale on which she works, this is the sample. So imagine this on top of the pole. Now Dark Moon Metals makes the steel frame and then she adds all the copper cladding to it. For the jig that I'm going to show you and the project portion of this with the bending fork, it's bending the support arms that ultimately hold the top of the carriage in place. I have the jig set up for the arm and the vise and I have my bending fork. Now the problem with the bending fork that I'm having is that these pegs are a little bit too long for the material. I had originally made this for another project. So what's happening, as I put a piece of material in the jig, clamping it down, it's wanting to rock. So if these pegs were shorter, it would be perfect. But I'm not going to cut the pegs on this one any shorter because this is for another project. So I'm going to be making a second bending fork. All right, guys. The original twisting wrench was made out of half-inch square bar. Uh, the pins were made out of 3 8 The square bar is cut to about 13 inches long, and these pins were cut to, I believe, inch and three quarters. The next twisting wrench, it's going to use the same size square stock, same size round stock, except these are going to be a half an inch shorter. These have been cut to an inch and a quarter. Now the first step in making my particular version of a twisting wrench is taking, marking your center holes, so I get it in the light there, and drilling a quarter inch pilot hole all the way through the bar. Uh, I need to reduce this, let me get in the camera here, I need to reduce the thickness of this by about half. So I'm going to put it in the forge and we're going to draw it out a little bit. Oh, in case you didn't see it in one of my other videos, yes, this is a hacked together wooden mallet from a baseball bat. Best mallet I've ever had made of wood. Alright guys, if you take your time and you're careful with your fit, that you really don't need to plug weld these
Now, as you can see, I did leave them about an eighth of an inch below the surface. I am gonna go in and plug weld them, but really, these things are not gonna come out. So if you're careful with your holes, you really can do this without having to bring welding into the mix. One more. So as you can see, having a jig made up specifically for a job can come in handy, especially if that job is repetitive. Now, the very first jig I made for Gatesmore Lighting, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to show you. Uh, basically what it was, uh, this is kind of a cobbled together jig that her father made. I'm not exactly sure what this is for or how it worked, but what I need to do is replicate this scroll inside. That's going to be for another project. Now, I made this scroll a couple of times before, but I made it out of copper. I didn't make it out of steel. And um, it was a train wreck trying to get this exactly right. I needed to get three of them that matched. This was before I had the forge. I was using um, oxyacetylene torches, trying to heat up copper. And copper is very hard to tell when it gets hot because it dissipates heat so quickly. Uh, and quenching it, it doesn't harden it at all. It just anneals it so it's still soft. But the jig that I made to make these ends of the scroll, are you ready for it? How pitiful is that? That's actually, I believe, um, just scrap I had thrown together. Didn't really care too much about it. I just wanted something for consistency. I mean, you could tell I rated the scrap bin. Um, this was back before I had a real scrap bin to really pull from. Uh, this is probably maybe six weeks into us starting the business. So this is before the plasma cam, before all that good stuff. I am going to be remaking this jig because this just needs to go into a scrap bin. Plus, if you notice, let me see if I can get this in here. That pipe is not the right size for that curl. So that's completely useless anyway. So what I've done is I've gone out and I have found the appropriate size round stock. That is going to be the stop. And I'm also going to use the end of this as a measurement point to figure out how far in the curl needs to go to the round stock. This bar is going to hold my new jig in the vise. This I originally had made for the anvil and um, while yes, it was functional, uh, like I said, I don't like it. I'd rather have it in the vise and free the envelope for other things. And that is going to be what holds everything together. Now I know this is a lot bigger than it needs to be, but I'm trying to keep all of these jigs consistent. That way, if for some reason we move out of the area or we close down or whatever, and Pat or her daughter decides to move to a different welder or fabricator, I could perhaps even sell these jigs um, as they are to whoever that new person is rather than him having to make his own. The other nice thing about this with all the extra space, once we figure out the exact length material needs to be to just cut it and form the part and you're done, we can engrave with the AirScribe all of the critical information. What size round stock it is, um, the length the round stock needs to be, and so on. All right, YouTube, now it's time to turn our attention to the scroll. The first thing to tackle is this loop. I've got a piece in the forge heating up. Let's see how well the jig matches.
Trying to bend the same exact curve every single time without a jig is a real pain in the butt. And yes, experienced smiths out there with a lot more experience than I do could probably do it repeatedly with very little effort. But I am not an experienced smith. The next thing I need to do, now that I know I can make these loops, is to figure out the overall length of material I need to make this piece. So basically figure out my measurement, how long the bar needs to be, so I can just bend it, and I'm done. Now, one of the things I didn't show you, and I kind of changed the way this jig was designed on the fly. I was originally going to weld a square bar to the bottom of this jig that would allow me to clamp it in the vise. Rather than do that, I decided to incorporate a jig in this that will allow me to put this curve in once I get my overall length figured out. And how that works, It's right here. This piece serves as a stop. Here's the radius that I need, the curve. This will just sit in the vise like so. I could take the straight piece, put it right up against the stop, and then just start pulling this in with a pair of pliers to get the curve. Once this is nice and hot, it's gonna bend like butter. Well, folks, I think I'm gonna wrap things up right now. Uh, I've still got a lot of work to do. I was definitely not planning on shooting two videos today, but that's, <laughs> that's what ended up happening. Um, a lot of the work we've been doing in the shop has been a lot of repetition. Um, a lot of it is stuff that you've already seen. Uh, this video on making specific jigs for projects kind of you know, should give you an idea that yes, taking the time to make tooling is worth it, especially if it's repeat business. Uh, I am going to include a link for Gatesmore Lighting in the description. Uh, Pat is a really wonderfully talented artist. In fact, when I did my first anvil video before I had one, I mentioned that the anvil I was demonstrating with came out of a copper shop. Well, that's Pat's anvil. So she really has been with us from the beginning of this business. and. I'm really glad that uh, her daughter has taken an interest in the business and will kind of carry on the family tradition. So, that being said, uh, I have my own business and hopefully tradition that uh, I need to kind of get back to. Um, we are over 15,000 subscribers now, which is absolutely phenomenal considering that we don't post videos very often, which is something that we are mindful of and we are trying to change. Uh, some of you may know that I recently published a book uh, I have the second book finished, it needs to go through the editing process, and the third book is already in the works. Um, I never thought I'd be traveling down this road because I am dyslexic, and for me writing a book is like trying to fly a kite in a hurricane. Uh, it's just not easy. And my editors, um, to quote John Panette, some quit, some turn to drugs and alcohol, so yeah. Um, but there's a lot going on in the shop, and there is more coming up uh, within the next couple of days even that I do plan on sharing with you. Until then, this has been Jeff at Darkwood Metals and I will see you again soon.